The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Uh, Welcome to the live recording of the Short Circuit podcast. We are at the University of Chicago Law School. Thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting us. (laughs) Yeah. I'm Anya Bidwal, an attorney with the Institute for Justice. With me are three wonderful panelists, Tacey Flint, Will Bode, and Jim Pander. Uh, Today on the podcast, we will discuss three recently released Seventh Circuit opinions dealing with issues of individual liberties and talk a bit about the Seventh Circuit in general. Before we begin and before I introduce my panelists in greater detail, let me just ask that you folks subscribe to our weekly newsletter called Short Circuit. Uh, where we discuss important circuit court opinions. There are a ton of newsletters that talk about Supreme Court opinions, but it all starts at the circuit level. So subscribe to our um, circuit uh, uh, level podcast. And let me also ask that you apply for our summer clerkships. The application period for this summer is now closed, but consider us for your summer 2020 adventure. Now on to our panelists. Tacey Flint is a partner at Sidley Austin here in Chicago. She's a superstar appellate litigator who practices before the uh, Supreme Court, the Seventh Circuit, and numerous other courts of appeals around the country. She clerked for the Seventh Circuit Judge Richard Posner, who retired in 2017, and you all guys know him as a faculty member, and for the US Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. She got her law degree in this university, graduating with the highest honors and setting academic records that other students are still trying to catch up to. Thank you, Tacey, for being here, and it's an honor to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Anya. (laughs) Now, Professor Will Bode needs no introduction, since he has uh, taught here at the University of Chicago Law School for at least five years. Is that right? Yep. Sounds right. (laughs) I did my algebra right. Among his subjects are constitutional law and federal courts. Will is a prolific author. One of his most influential works is an article on qualified immunity titled, Is Qualified Immunity Unlawful? The article has successfully challenged assumptions about qualified immunity's common law roots and has been cited in essentially every scholarly or legal work advocating for the reconsideration of the doctrine. Will clerked on the 10th Circuit for Michael McConnell and then for John Roberts on the US Supreme Court. He also clerked for IJ after his first year of law school. Welcome, Will. (laughs) Far more important. Thank you. Uh, And uh, let's talk about Jim. Jim Fander is Owen L. Kuhn Professor of Law at the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. He teaches constitutional law, federal courts, and conflicts of law, among other classes. He is also a prolific author near and dear to my heart are his articles on Bivens versus six unnamed agents of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. His groundbreaking work on the subject is changing perceptions, not only about this very important case, but also generally about the need for availability of a cause of action against federal officers for their constitutional violations. Jim is a graduate of the University of Virginia Law School, and he clerked for the First Circuit Judge Levin Campbell. Welcome, Jim. Hi, thanks, Anya. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's briefly talk about the Seventh Circuit uh, before we jump into our opinions. There are currently 11 active judges. Two of them, Diane Wood and David Hamilton, were appointed by Democrat presidents, and the rest were appointed by Republican presidents. Donald Trump appointed four judges so far. That's more than a third of the bench. And that's a question to anyone. Um, Do you guys notice a shift in the court's opinions or in the court's dynamic at all, given these new four appointees? Well, it's still pretty early um, since the four of them have joined. But I, I think we are starting to see, and I would certainly not be surprised if we continue to see, uh, a shift in the Seventh Circuit's dynamic, certainly compared to when I was clerking for Judge Posner back uh, now almost 15 years ago. Um, back then, the court was populated by, I mean, Judge Posner and Judge Easterbrook were both appointed by President Reagan in this sort of wave of conservative academic uh, appointments. but. I, the person I know the best is Judge Posner, and even though he is uh, popularly thought of as conservative, um, I think people who have actually read a lot of his opinions would say he's not predictable according to those normal lines. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, the court as a whole was not predictable, and it didn't have a lot of 
uh, dissension. There weren't a ton of separate opinions, very rarely took cases on banc, and in the rare occasions when cases were taken on banc, um, just as I said about Judge Posner, it was sort of hard to predict uh, how, what the breakup was going to be. My guess is that will be less true going forward. Um, probably, I think the pace of on banc, cases taken on banc, um, I haven't actually checked the data, but I think it's already increased with the um, new Trump appointees who, as you've pointed out, are a huge share mm -hmm. of the active judges. And um, you know, I think that may well be a change. It'll be interesting to see. But the court remains a very, I think, I've always thought it's the best regional circuit, you know, just to say that out, <laughs> to say that out loud. Uh, and the appointees, the recent appointees are also, um, you know, really smart judges, just as the court has always had. So I'm sure that will continue. You guys have anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I think, that's, I think the, the Seventh Circuit has never been one of the most uh, politically polarized circuits in the country. I don't think it's going to start becoming one of the most politically polarized circuits in the country. That's probably a good thing. There's obviously some continuity, you know, in line with the Posner and Easterbrook appointments. Now we have Amy Coney Barrett, a top-notch Fed courts professor, sort of making sure that academics continue to get their representation uh, on the federal bench, too, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think probably... We have two Fed courts professors here on the panel. Indeed. Just <laughs> I think maybe the more, dramatic, the more dramatic change is the retirement of Richard Posner. I think that, that I think his influence is sort of, uh, was so widespread on the Seventh Circuit and so many opinions and every panel he was on. And I think that absence is noticeable, mm -hmm. uh, maybe more so than anything else. I would only add that the other important sort of distinction is the University of Chicago Northwestern distinction on the bench. And uh, you know, we've, we've made a little bit of progress with, uh, with Michael Scudder's appointment, so we're happy about that. <laughs> you uh, guys all mentioned uh, that um, the court actually is not as polarized as you think it would be, given the sort of number of Republicans versus Democratic appointees. For example, the Fifth Circuit comes to mind as one of those that tends to have opinions with lots of dissents, you know, 30, 40, 50 pages long. Uh, why do you think that is? Because if you just were to look at the numbers, right, leave everything else alone, you'd expect Seventh Circuit to be more um, sort of uh, added than it actually is. Midwestern values. <laughs> there was a tradition um, started many years ago by the chief requiring more um, sort of um, a, a more, more of a centering around the city of Chicago for the Seventh Circuit requirement that people kind of move to Chicago. Maybe there's a greater sense of community around the court. I know that the, just, the judges of that circuit spend more time in the city than many other circuit judges do, in the sense that they're here almost every week. They're not as um, uh, provincial in the sense that they don't spend quite as much time in their own chambers. Not sure what that would do to the sort of dynamic, but. Um, they know each other better. In perhaps other that's words. right, yeah. Interesting. Uh, by the way, just uh, Chief Judge Diane Wood is UT law grad from Austin, Texas, so it's not only about Midwestern valleys. <laughs> she famously got along with Easterbrook and Posner, right? <laughs> Quite an achievement. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's this tradition on the Seventh Circuit uh, where the judges, um, in a way, are sort of hands off. This is a term a colleague of mine used, or at least back in the day, they were sort of hands off. They certainly brought their own views to their own opinions, but they didn't tend to, um, uh, you know, combat others' opinions or, um, it, which is, I think is reflected in the small number of en banc cases that, that mm -hmm. were taken en banc. Um, so who knows how much that will continue. Uh, maybe Midwestern values will allow the court to stay not that polarized. That's, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Well, we shall see. And before we move on to the opinions, I just have to ask you, Tacey, and I love your judges, guys, too, but we're talking about the Seventh <laughs> Circuit, right? So I just have to ask you about your experience of clerking for Judge Posner. You know, I've said many times that, that my year with Judge Posner, uh, and his clerks call him Dick, so I probably will refer to him that way before I finish talking. Um, that was really the single greatest professional year uh, of my career to date and probably ever. You know, it was a great job in just about every respect. It, the opportunity to sit down with Dick, uh, we talked about every case that was argued with him. We didn't, the clerks didn't split up cases. We 
all worked on all the cases, um, at least before argument. So to get to talk to Dick about every single case that we heard argument on, hear his views, to a small degree help shape his views. <laughs> uh, but obviously we were much more influenced by him than vice versa. Um, and then see the writing that he produced and get to read his writing uh, as regularly as I did was such an education. I mean, I'm sure people here at University of Chicago are, uh, you're probably aware of Dick's reputation for producing a huge number of words in a short amount of time and as an academic, but also as a judge. I mean, he would write his opinions that day or uh, by the next morning, no later than the next morning after the court heard um, argument every single time. And the truth is they did not change that much from that first draft because the first draft was exceptional. Um, I mean, the body of work that Dick produced over his career is amazing and to be a part of it for a year was great. Um, and I also feel compelled to add, it was a great job because uh, we didn't have a lot of hours. Like we, <laughs> we went to the office, we went to the chambers, we worked with him, we worked on interesting stuff. He somehow magically took care of a lot of the work that I understand other law clerks have to do, such as you know reviewing petitions for rehearing, or uh, we didn't draft bench memos, that kind of thing. Um, so. It was really just fully substantive work with one of the great legal minds um, and then going home and spending time with your friends. So it's pretty great. <laughs> Stacy, I can't help but ask. Um, there's a great story about Douglas who got bored waiting for the dissent. So he wrote both the majority and the dissent in one case. <laughs> did Posner ever do that as well? Not my year. I can't say he did. <laughs> but he probably could have. Uh, and uh, so he, he, he took the lead, essentially, on drafting every single opinion, right? Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, not just the lead. He definitely wrote his own opinions uh, from start to finish. And we then edited them, and he definitely took our edits. Um, we supplied uh, case law and precedent, and um, he was also very interested in um, acad the academic perspective on the cases we worked on. But, uh, you know, 100% he wrote the opinions, and 100% as you can tell, mm -hmm. they're entirely in his voice. Yes, he used to make a, a joke about how some judges, their voice changes. Uh, depending <laughs> year on, by year. <laughs> year by year, exactly. Um, all right, that was uh, wonderful. Thank you for that. And now let's get uh, into uh, substance. Will, I'm going to put you on the spot first. Uh, <laughs> Now you know how it feels to cold call, to be cold called on. <laughs> well, yeah. you knew that before, but you probably forgot. Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to say, so I teach federal courts uh, right after this, and so to my current and former students here, I now understand uh, <laughs> what it feels like to be put on the spot to recall a bunch of factual and procedural details uh, in a case that you're reading for the first time. Uh, I swear I've read this case repeatedly, and still pieces of it keep floating out of my head, so I'm probably going to screw something up. Uh, but... Uh, I guess I'm not being graded. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's too late now. Uh, so my case is Lewis versus the city of Chicago, uh, an opinion written by Judge Diane Sykes uh, on a panel with uh, Judge Ripple and Judge Barrett. And it's a Section 1983 civil rights claim uh, with a couple of both substantive and procedural issues. But basically, uh, the plaintiff, Maurice Lewis, uh, was arrested on a gun charge that he claims was totally fabricated. Uh, as I understand it, he, there were a group of people who were arrested in an apartment, and there was a gun in the apartment, and he claims there's no evidence that he had the gun, was near the gun, or lived in the apartment, and that the police officers just falsely wrote down that he had admitted he lived there, uh, which he didn't. But uh, that's enough to keep him locked up for two years, uh, so he spends two years in pretrial detention uh, until the charges are eventually dropped once the prosecutor pays attention to the case. Uh, and when he gets out, he's pretty upset about that, and so he sues. Uh, for damages for a uh, uh, Fourth Amendment or due process constitutional violation for you know lying about uh, whether he'd done anything wrong and then locking him up for two years. Uh, so that's his case. And the Seventh Circuit holds in an opinion they try to make pretty straightforward that his claim can succeed. Uh, that first of all, uh, you can bring this claim as a, as a matter of sort of substantive constitutional law. He has a cause of action under the Fourth Amendment, uh, which forbids unreasonable searches and seizures being uh, in pretrial detention for two years is a seizure. Uh, and if you're there because the police officers lied to the judge, uh, that's enough to make it unreasonable. That's a little bit, it had been a little bit ambiguous and courts had disagreed about it some uh, because it's 
it is it is the case that he's only locked up in pretrial detention after a judge has found that there's probable cause to to detain him. And we often think that having a judicial determination of probable cause, like a warrant, is enough to sort of it's good enough for the Fourth Amendment. Uh, but the court says uh, there's some precedent suggesting that if you lie to procure the warrant, maybe that's a problem. Uh, so if you lie to get somebody locked up, maybe that's still a problem. And there's a recent Supreme Court case also arising out of the Seventh Circuit, uh, Manuel versus City of Joliet, uh, that the court takes to confirm that this is a Fourth Amendment claim. Until this, there'd also been some confusion of whether this claim was instead or maybe in addition a due process claim, because here you are being deprived of liberty in a way without due process if Again, the process consisted of the government lying to the judge. Uh, but the court says that due process claim has no, is no longer recognized by the Supreme Court precedent in its own prior precedent. It's Fourth Amendment, not due process. So we've got the right constitutional box for it. That's issue one. Issue two uh, is that, for understandable reasons, uh, Mr. Lewis only sues after he gets out. Uh, and he's been in for a couple of years. So depending on when his claim arises, the statute of limitations may have run. Uh, but the court says, relying on its own case on remand from that Supreme Court case, Manuel, that the statute of limitations doesn't start to run until you're released uh, or until the charges against you are dropped. We don't really expect you to bring a Fourth Amendment claim for uh, unreasonable seizure while you're still subject to the seizure. Uh, and so that's good enough for his, uh, for his Fourth Amendment claim to, to survive. Uh, there is a Supreme Court case currently pending, I think, on this very issue, uh, which the court just mentions in a footnote and kind of moves on. So some uh, some more reticent courts might have held on to the case to wait and see if Supreme Court precedent was going to dramatically change things before issuing their opinion. But that's uh, the Seventh Circuit way, I think, is just to, to decide the cases under the law you have and, and let somebody else sort it out. Uh, I know Jim has written an amicus brief in that Supreme Court case. Maybe he'll remind us what's going to happen in that case. Uh, that's outside the bounds of my cold call. Um, <laughs> so that, and so that's, that's the core of it. There, there is also then, uh, what the court deals with remarkably briefly, uh, a question of what's called qualified immunity. So normally, when you sue people, uh, police officers, for violating your constitutional rights. And I wonder rights, why Will is talking about this particular case. <laughs> I, I, sees it every year. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say, I had to read the case twice before I even recognized that they talked about qualified immunity, because yes. they sort of just, just breezed yeah. past it. Uh, so normally, you're only supposed to be able to uh, hold a government official liable, not only because they violate your constitutional rights, but because they violate so-called clearly established law, which, according to the Supreme Court, means it has to be super duper clearly established such that only uh, an evil person or a moron uh, wouldn't recognize that what they were doing was illegal. Uh, I think that's more or less the standard. They don't use the word moron. They say, <laughs> all but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. But, you know. Uh, so, so normally you're not supposed to be able to sue government officials very easily uh, unless the law is really clearly established. But the court says, look, uh, it's pretty clearly established that you're not supposed to lie to the court about evidence to hold people locked up. And that's what they're alleged to have done. So that's enough for that issue. Even though they were kind of confused about the source of the law? Uh, right. So this, so yeah, so this is then the, the – when I looked at the city of Chicago's briefs, and one of their points was, look, until a year or two ago – Nobody thought you could bring this claim as a, uh, as a Fourth Amendment claim in the Seventh Circuit. You had to bring it as a due process claim. And only after all this happened has the Supreme Court and the Seventh Circuit clarified this is a Fourth Amendment violation, which nobody knew it was before. So they say, basically, you shouldn't be able to sue us under the Fourth Amendment because it wasn't clear, clear that we violated the Fourth Amendment. And you shouldn't be able to sue us under the due process clause, which is what people thought it was before, because actually it's not the due process clause. It's the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> I feel like there's a little bit of a catch-22 yeah. if the answer is like, well, we knew what we were doing was unconstitutional, and it's been unconstitutional all along, but at some point we moved the violation from one clause to the other, and that should create a kind of like several years of fog that let all the police officers uh, get away with it. So I, I'm pleased that the Seventh Circuit didn't buy that argument, but frankly, a little surprised. Uh, What's amazing to me is that they don't even spend that much time on it. They kind of say that's pretty obvious. There is a constitutional violation, and it doesn't matter whether it comes from the Fourth Amendment or from the uh, violation of due process. Yeah. Uh, yeah, look. Uh, <laughs> if, so now, if I were doing the grading, <laughs> I'd say there's like a little bit of an issue spotting failure here, although I suspect it's intentional. Uh, I suspect it, you know. 
uh, when courts hold that police officers don't have qualified immunity, a little red uh, alarm in the Supreme Court goes off that warns them that somewhere an officer might be forced to pay for their constitutional violations and the Supreme Court might need to swoop in to summarily reverse the decision and stop uh, something like that from happening. So if you do want to hold officers liable, smart judges know that you should do it in the most undramatic, uninteresting way possible uh, to make the case seem like it's just an ordinary fact-bound application of well-settled law. So which Will, does the, does. does the city's analysis where we know it was wrong, but we don't know why it, we didn't know why it was wrong, does that actually hold up in any other context, or has that been held up in any other context? <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I was trying to think of analogies. I think there are. Uh, cases where, where criminal defendants try this argument and usually also lose. You know, so if you say, I wasn't trying to kill them, I was just trying to shoot the gun to scare them, we say, ah, well, the fact that you were intending to do one bad thing often transfers to the other. It's, it's often hard to, to get away with that. So, so I'm, I don't think it necessarily holds up. But, but I haven't thought it through super carefully. And <laughs> by all light evidence, neither is the Seventh Circuit. <laughs> <laughs> do you uh, think that the Seventh Circuit is sort of a uh, more adventurous when it comes to the issue of qualified immunity and more willing to entertain that that defense should not be used, should not be available? I, I, I don't know. I think it's maybe this is actually just the triumph of common sense. Like, it really seems like the point of qualified immunity is when, like, there was some real ambiguity over whether, whether you were doing something wrong, either because the law was changing a lot or maybe just because, like, it's one of these really fact-intensive standards, like, when you can use force and it's a fast-moving situation. And this certainly isn't either of those. I don't think anybody is suggesting, you know, like, in the moment, the police officers just thought, oh, yeah, I'm allowed to lie, and it was only because of some, like, weird legal loophole this is a problem. So I do think if you just have a common sense sort of like take a step back approach, it just, just doesn't seem like what qualified immunity is for. Mm -hmm. uh, now qualified immunity doesn't always follow common sense, but, but I think it would be an improvement if it did. So maybe it's just that. Indeed. Uh, could, let's talk a little bit more about this distinction between the Fourth Amendment and due process. Um, for our non-lawyer audience, why does it matter what amendment you use in order to vindicate your rights? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I'm really confused about that. <laughs> so, so it, I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure it does, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I mean, so the Fourth Amendment has a, it traditionally relies on standards of probable cause and reasonableness. And the Fifth Amendment is traditionally about process, although there's also a line of doctrine under the Due Process Clause that are instead about whether the government did something outrageous. So in theory, the kinds of things you might do to justify a seizure are slightly different under them. Under the Fourth Amendment, you want to say, look, we had some reason to believe you were guilty, and that's good enough. Under the Fifth Amendment, you either want to say, look, we gave you a fair procedure, or we didn't do something super outrageous. But there's a lot of overlap between these things. And in practice, in the cases I read, the courts often don't quite know what these constitutional provisions are supposed to mean. And so they borrow heavily from the common law of torts. And so there's all sorts of judicial opinions about, should we view this as like a false arrest claim or like a false imprisonment claim or like a malicious prosecution claim? And then they try to decide how much to borrow those for the different elements of the constitutional tests. And sometimes it seems like they don't actually care what constitutional provision it is. They just, you know, they don't know what it means anyway, and they just want to attach it to the common law of torts. So, so I'm frankly not positive why that is. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I thought there was something about what um, state law process was available to the seized person, um, which would be relevant to the due process claim, but not relevant to the Fourth Amendment claim. So yeah, so in some procedural due process cases, if there's an adequate state law process, that's enough to justify inadequate, other, so that's enough to justify inadequate process. Although I think that is more common for claims about property than it is about liberty. Right. Uh, so normally, the fact that, the, that they deprived you of your liberty without a trial isn't excused by the fact that you can sue them for a state law claim. Right. So in the end, even if you might talk about state law procedures, if given you've got a police officer lying about you know, right. the facts, it's it, not going to end up mattering. It seems like it drops away. I will say, so I had, uh, there were several of these cases uh, involving due process versus Fourth Amendment, statutes of limitations, common law torts when I clerked in the Tenth Circuit. And they, I tried to write my first uh, academic article about them because I was convinced the courts were so confused and somebody just needed to go in and sort out all the history and all the cases and what made sense. And it, 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 it defeated me. Uh, <laughs> this article does not, somebody does need to sort all that stuff out and has got to be a better man than I. <laughs> Why does, uh, why does the court essentially decide that the, the two are mutually exclusive? 
that and it overturns its own precedent and hurt. Uh, so, so they're following the Supreme Court's lead. Right. Uh, so the Supreme Court, in the course of recognizing that this was a Fourth Amendment claim, maybe implicitly said, and it's not a due process claim. And there is a general principle that because the due process clause is the most open-ended and confusing of all the Bill of Rights, if you have two possible uh, claims, a due process claim and something else, the court says you just go with the something else. Uh, so the court in previous cases about you know, when the police officers beat you up, whether that violates due process. They used to say it does, and they said, actually, we'll just put it all under the Fourth Amendment. And then we've got a more, more specific provision in the Fourth Amendment that deals with it rather than the due process claim. So there, there's a way in which the court is a little bit afraid of the due process clause mm -hmm. and eager to parcel things out to other clauses that at least have a slightly more specific topic. But the court goes out of its way to talk about also convictions in the last paragraph and saying, listen, if it's a conviction under false pretenses, yes. then it's not Fourth Amendment thing. Right. It's due process. Then it's still going to be a due process claim. Right. right. So, that, so I think there is this sense, and this is something that courts have also wrestled with, that so you look at sort of the spectrum of the wrongful arrest conviction process, the start where the police officer just arrests you for no good reason seems like it's clearly a Fourth Amendment problem. Like that's just the officer seizing you on their own authority without a good reason, that's a Fourth Amendment problem. And the end, where you had a trial, but the trial was a miscarriage of justice because of some procedural rule that wasn't followed, like the prosecutor suppressing evidence, that seems like it's a due process problem. And where along the way it turns from the police officer on the street to the miscarriage of justice after trial is something that they are not super clear on. And the court has some previous cases, including one by Justice Scalia called Wallace versus Cato, that refers to these points at which the, the, they change. And he references like a couple different things. He's like, it's the moment at which you've been arraigned, or bound over, or at which there's been a hearing by a judge, which all turn out not to be the same thing, depending on state procedural rules, but all kind of sound similar. Uh, and I think they're sort of wrestling with this a little bit, too. So, this, so even now, the Seventh Circuit is still saying, after a trial, we've got lots of due process procedural rules that'll kick in. But until then, it's the Fourth Amendment. You could imagine, based on, on common law conceptions of process, that there'd be a change in the focus, the liability focus, after some formal arraignment or binding over took place. Um, and then liability would shift to any officers that made false statements in order to get that judicial approval. And I think one of the reasons that the court has been t wrestling with it, you can see this struggle in the uh, oral argument in the McDonough case, the case that deals with this question of uh, when a, a, a statute of limitations begins to run against a prisoner in a case like one of these involving fabrication of evidence. And you can see the kind of confusion that w Will ran up against in writing his article on this subject reflected in the oral argument in that case. It's just, to my mind, quite revealing of just how uncertain the lines of responsibility are and how you trace them to the appropriate constitutional provision. Right. But I, I, you know, I get the common sense intuition again that there's, it's one thing when the executive officer by themselves is doing something wrong. And then at some point, we want them to rely on a judge. We want them to say, look, I thought this person was doing something wrong. I brought them before the judge. The judge said it was a crime. You know, at that point, it's not my fault anymore. Like, I, you know, I did what you wanted me to. But then, as, as Jim said, it turns out there's often a slippery relationship to those two. Like, I brought the person before the judge, but didn't tell them everything they needed to know. <laughs> how much of that responsibility is mine? How much of that responsibility is the judge's? Uh, and we're still trying Seven to Seventh Circuit, it. all about common sense. <laughs> Let's move on to our next opinion, and Jim, uh, please talk about Washington and the lack of uh, post-seizure uh, there. Right. So uh, this is a 2018 decision by uh, a three-judge panel of the Seventh Circuit, including Judges Flom, Ripple, and Mannion. And the opinion itself doesn't um, break much in the way of new ground. It takes up, takes up a case on appeal from a district court decision that had enjoined the Indiana forfeiture system. Uh, from its application uh, um, uh, to people in the position of Leroy Washington, the plaintiff in this class action case. Um, but the court doesn't do anything with the appeal other than to take account of the fact that Indiana has since amended the law governing civil forfeiture in the state. Uh, and the prosecutors now, the prosecutor is now arguing uh, that the new law um, is no longer violative of the due process rights that the plaintiff class had asserted. 
and therefore that uh, the case should be dismissed. Instead of dismissing, the Seventh Circuit remanded for further consideration by the district court to take account of the arguments made by the prosecutor that this new uh, statute, um, this new Indiana law, uh, no longer represents a violation of procedural due process. So that's the decision. It's a fairly, um, uh, it's not exactly a, a path marking decision. It's a wait and see kind of case. We'll send it back to the district court, see what the district judge does with it, and then wrestle with it again, perhaps on appeal, but um, not an uncommon strategy for a Seventh Circuit panel to adopt. In the case itself, it's very much like the other civil forfeiture proceedings that we see. The plaintiff in the class action was arrested by the Indianapolis, the Indianapolis um, City Police Department. Um, and charged with uh, trafficking marijuana. A forfeiture was instituted against his vehicle, um, and it was forfeited, taken away from him. He filed a uh, petition to recover it, and then a class action challenging, under the procedural due process provisions of the 14th Amendment, the seizure of his property without any previous notice and an opportunity to be heard uh, before the property was taken away. Um, and so right there, uh, by the way, is it is it a due process issue or is it actually a Fourth Amendment issue? Well, right? it was litigated as a due process issue, um, and, uh, and and that's the way the court comes at it. Um, you, you, one could, I suppose, frame it in those terms. He's not challenging the search. He's not challenging his arrest incident to the um, uh, transaction that he had with the Indiana. Indianapolis Police Department. But there was a seizure of a vehicle. But there was a seizure of a vehicle, right. So um, I'm not sure about that characterization, actually. I'm not sure that I have seen cases that have wrestled with that characterization question. Yeah, there is an opinion from the Ninth Circuit from uh, Judge Kaczynski uh, a couple of years back, and uh, it actually looks at this issue from the perspective of Fourth Amendment. But most of the circuits seem to look at it as a due process issue. Right, and that's the way this one was teed up by the plaintiff. One of the things this case teaches is it teaches us a lot about the strategies that defendant cities, counties, and other 1983 defendants use in an effort to try to blunt the effect of this sort of litigation. So think about all the strategies that the city of Indianapolis used here to try to make this case go away. The first thing they did was return the vehicle, right? Um, so they gave the vehicle back as soon as there was some litigation about that. And then they argued, you got the vehicle back, the case is moot, and tried to argue that the, uh, that the litigation should be set aside on that basis. The district court didn't accept that argument, in part because, um, well, it's, it, 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 there, there are interesting questions about class action mootness, and this case implicates a number of them. I'm not sure how far down in those weeds we want to get, but... Um, but it's a very great point to bring, sort of yes. the, all the different ways that you can use to get rid of a civil forfeiture case. So right. So one way on. is to return the vehicle and argue that since this is only an action for injunctive relief or prospective relief to recover the vehicle, um, you, you really are not in a position to push, to push the claim forward. So in many of these cases, it would be useful for the class to include um, allegations and requests for an award of damages for the interruption in the use of the vehicle or other kinds of losses that you may have suffered as a result of the taking. Um, and those claims obviously would not be mooted by the return of the vehicle. Um, um, and the problem, of course, is it may be very difficult to certify a class, given that the circumstances surrounding those seizures are going to be quite particular and specific to each particular instance of interaction with, uh, with the constabulary. So you're not necessarily going to be able to get certification, but you might be able to address the, um, the mootness issue with, uh, with uh, uh, the inclusion of some allegations seeking an award of damages. Anyway, the district court um, reached the merit, certified the class, and enjoined the application of the statutes. So that first gambit, the return of the vehicle gambit, didn't work for the, for, the, for the Indianapolis Police Department here. And so the next step in that process, and this is a very common uh, strategy for, uh, for cities and counties, and perhaps one we should applaud because shouldn't we like hope that our government responds to litigation by trying to come into conformity with the law? And so you might argue that the decision of the state of, Indian, of Indiana to amend the statute to try to address the constitutional issues that had been identified in the litigation is commendable. Um, one might also argue that it's designed to, to make the case go away with the least possible uh, change in the nature of the law. And the law changed uh, 
not so much in this case, as it turns out. And that's the point that the plaintiff class and their representatives are making, uh, both to the Seventh Circuit and to the district court when the case goes back. You didn't really um, put much of a burden on the prosecutor to initiate a forfeiture. You did create some kind of minor procedural adjustment that allows the owner of the vehicle to petition for its return to kind of block the forfeiture with petition, but it doesn't take much apparently for the prosecutor to trump that uh, by filing a simple motion for uh, the forfeiture of the vehicle. So the argument is that not much has changed, and certainly there's very little uh, by way of pre-seizure pre -seizure notice and an opportunity, even under the statute as it has been amended. Um, and so in a procedural due process contest like this one, you're going to be focusing on the adequacy to some extent of post-seizure um, uh, remedies and so on. And so some of the debate will be over the adequacy of the notice and opportunity on the front end, and some will be, as Will pointed out, on the adequacy of post-seizure uh, or forfeiture process on the back end. Um, and that will be, I think, the focus of the litigation when the case goes back to the district court. As you all know, forfeitures uh, very much in the news these days and in the courts these days. There's a recent case, Tim's against Indiana, in which the Supreme Court uh, concluded in, in, in another case coming out of Indiana, interestingly, that it's an IJ case too. I it is an to IJ case, right? It's quite an interesting case, <laughs> and they concluded that um, the excessive fines provision of the Eighth Amendment is in fact incorporated against the states, and so uh, the states are supposed to are supposed to evaluate any forfeiture against that uh, the, the standard of excessiveness that now is part of the the law of the Eighth Amendment. So there's all that going on, and then. Um, uh, a collection of really interesting new research on the nature of forfeiture. One of the things about forfeiture law, and one of the reasons it was so slow to take root in the decisional law of the Supreme Court, was the, the sort of argument from history. The argument from history is, the United States has always been forfeiting property, you know, on the basis of relatively little by way of a showing of wrongdoing. And even in circumstances where the value of the property forfeited was vastly in excess of the value of the misconduct that was involved in the case. And typically in these cases, there's a 1974 opinion written by Justice Brennan. Um, in, a, in a yacht forfeiture case, and he invokes the history of forfeiture on the seven seas, you know, back in the day when we were, you know, <laughs> enforcing the revenue laws by, uh, by forfeiting uh, yachts and vessels that were sailed into port, unloading cargo outside of the compliance with the revenue laws. And that system was actually pretty draconian. Um, but recent scholarship, a really interesting paper by Kevin Arlick shows that those forfeitures were often remitted at the center by the Secretary of the Treasury. So even though the judicial regime of forfeiture was quite strict, there was justice in the courts, but there was mercy at the Secretary of Treasury's office uh, in, in the person of Alexander Hamilton, who we can now say, we can now say he remitted virtually all of those forfeitures. So the old regime was not nearly as strict as it sometimes appears to be, and that might change the conception of the history of civil forfeiture in ways that might inform the development of the doctrine. And as Justice uh, Thomas points out in his Leonard um, uh, write-up, right, he talks about also the history of forfeiture, and he talks about the necessity, right? For example, back in the day, it was actually very important because uh, to, to, to kind of uh, have this jurisdiction of a property because the individual was somewhere else. In this case, now you don't have this kind of necessity. And also the laws, there were just a few, like, uh, you know, custom laws, right? But now it applies all across. And one of the things that Justice Ginsburg pointed out in the Tim's argument was that we've basically abandoned the in persona and in rim distinction, for better or worse, in, in, and, and as a consequence, we can no longer use in rim tropes uh, to justify forfeitures that actually have a dramatic impact on individuals. Uh, and, and so that, further to your point, Anya, about the changing conception of the way people have rights in things, uh, or rights um, otherwise yeah, and, described. And just as a more general, as in, in the Fourth Amendment in general, when the court when the court is looking for evidence of sort of like founding era practice, it often finds it in 
uh, federal laws about customs and boats uh, during the first 10 years of the Republic, and then assumes that all those principles just g generalize uh, to all other kinds of searches. And I, you know, maybe that's right. I, don't, I think there's been not enough digging in sort of whether there were specific specific principles of extraterritoriality. Not enough digging, guys. Take note. <laughs> admiralty, also like that that might make that a special context. Uh, like the current fights about whether the government need, can search your laptop or your phone, you know, at the border for no reason because they could look, look at the boat. You know, may, maybe the analogy holds up perfectly, but but. I don't know. My spidey sense is tickling. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing, you know, the court does go out of its way to kind of talk about civil forfeitures and even uses this quote. In 2015, law enforcement took more property from Americans than criminals did. They certainly didn't have to use that quote and put it in there and cite to a study. What do you guys make of that, that, that the court actually, uh, in an opinion that itself is non-controversial, purposefully chooses to talk about this? I just think that it's, as we have, as we recognize, a much more high, high salience issue than it was maybe a generation ago. And, um, you know, that's, um, that's in part to credit to you. Well, can I ask one other question about the procedural posture? So you pointed out so the car was returned, uh, the laws were changed, but the case still proceeds. Um, it's a class, of course, so right. even if Mr. Washington uh, has gotten his relief, of course, the case can proceed. But there's also a point made that he said that this was an as-applied challenge, and the district court yes. said, actually, I think it's a facial <laughs> challenge, <laughs> which presumably was very helpful to keeping the case uh, in court, even after Mr. Washington's claim was resolved. So uh, that sort of supports what you're saying, Anya, about how um, there seems to be an eagerness to address this question and keep the case going as, as much as possible. Maybe you could take that to, uh, to operate as a kind of invitation to amend the complaint. Right. <laughs> An invitation. Strongly worded. A strongly worded invitation. Excellent. Thank you guys for this. And let's go on to our final case uh, for the day. Tacey, um, it's your turn. Okay. Uh, this case is called Gaston versus Ghosh. Um, it's a lawsuit br brought by an Illinois state prisoner. Um, against prison medical staff and the private entity that runs his prison, uh, the entity, the company is called Wexford, uh, claiming that he was denied medical treatment in violation of his Eighth Amendment rights. Um, so when prison officials are act with deliberate indifference towards serious medical needs of prisoners, that's a violation of the Eighth Amendment uh, prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. So Mr. Gaston complained about the medical treatment he received for his knees. At first, his left knee was injured and caused him a lot of pain, and he went to uh, prison doctors, and you know, first he got ibuprofen, and then he was said, they said, come back if that doesn't make it better, and he came back, and eventually he got evaluated. And as time went on, with months in between every appointment and uh, months after every scan, he finally got surgery uh, at a, at a non-prison hospital outside the prison um, on his left knee. In the meantime, however, uh, he had had all this pain while he was waiting for the surgery. Moreover, his right knee had started uh, hurting because his, he was favoring his left knee, so that caused damage to his right knee, which got worse and worse, and he started seeking uh, medical treatment for his right knee. That was delayed, and in fact, it was delayed in part because they said, we can't treat your right knee until we treat your left knee, so just don't even talk about your right knee for a while longer. Ultimately, he got two surgeries on his right knee, um, but, you know, over the years, he had a lot of pain while he was waiting for all this delay, delay, and delay. And also, uh, he, his knees were never, never as good as they maybe could have been. So he brought this lawsuit against the doctors who treated him at, the, at Stateville, the Illinois prison, uh, and also against Wexford. So the problem with his claims against the doctors, which ultimately he lost on summary judgment in the district court, the problem was he didn't have great evidence that any of these doctors had acted with deliberate indifference. They had heard his claims, they had you know, given him ibuprofen, they said, yeah, you should come back for an appointment if this doesn't clear up, or you should get an MRI or whatever. It just took forever in between, and it was not clear that that doctor whom he had sued, like Dr. Ghosh, was the person who was deliberately indifferent to his medical needs and failed to get <laughs> prompt care. Uh, he couldn't, he just didn't have good enough evidence to say who was the person that was responsible. Um, so Mr. Gaston tried to turn his claim against Wexford into uh, what would resolve this. He, he, and this is what his appeal really focused on. 
he, in essence, said, if I can, even if I don't know which individual doctor, or even if I can't show which individual uh, caused this delay, certainly Wexford is responsible because they're ultimately responsible for the medical care that all the prisoners receive. Um, so how do you establish liability under the Eighth Amendment against a, uh, the private corporation running the, pre the prison? Well, under Seventh Circuit precedent, which other courts agree with, a private entity uh, is liable for a constitutional violation uh, based on the actions of its employees only to the same degree that a municipality would be liable for the actions of its employees. Um, so there's this Supreme Court case called Monell, which says that uh, if you sue, for example, a police officer or a prison guard or something for an, an injury, um, the municipality or state entity on top that employs that prison guard or police officer won't be liable under standard vicarious liability principles the way employers normally are liable for torts committed by their employees in the and course really of employment. And really for folks who don't know what vicarious liability yeah. is, what is it? So if a, let's say a police officer injures you, um, and let's say a person in a store injures you in the course of that, that store clerk's employment, they're doing something for their job and you're injured, you're not limited to suing you know, that store clerk. Doesn't, you, you don't have to just hope that store clerk has enough money to pay for your medical care. Um, the, the company that owns the store is sort of automatically liable for torts committed by its employees regardless of whether in the they scope were of employment. That's right, regardless of whether the store told the employee to do that exact thing or had a policy of having employees do that exact thing. It's just, just sort of automatic. Uh, but that's not the case for municipalities. And um, under Seventh Circuit precedent, it's also not the case for private corporations that run prisons uh, and other private corporations who are sued under Section 1983 for constitutional violations. So that's uh, from a Seventh Circuit case in the 1980s called Iskander that extended Monell protections to private corporations. So um, Mr. Gaston, when he brought this lawsuit, said, here's what you should do. You should overrule Iskander and you should hold Wexford liable for my injuries. And uh, the reason that Mr. Gaston felt good about that claim is that the Seventh Circuit in a 2014 case called Shields, um, written by Judge Hamilton, had said, um, you know, we don't think Iskander is actually that great of an idea. Uh, Iskander extends Monell to private corporations. That doesn't really make sense because the reason Monell said that municipalities aren't liable for their employees uh, was on federalism grounds. The Supreme Court said when Congress enacted Section 1983 to allow states and municipalities to be sued under uh, for federal constitutional violations, they didn't think they could make municipalities um, or state entities equally liable under vic standard vicarious liability principles. They were concerned about that. So um, the Supreme Court, when it interpreted Section 1983 in Monell, said, so we're going to interpret Section 1983 as establishing liability only uh, if the municipality has a policy or practice um, that caused the injury, not just standard vicarious liability, but if they affirmatively have a policy or practice. Um, but federalism concerns don't apply to private corporations. So the, the Seventh Circuit opinion in Shields said, I think we were probably wrong when we just extended Monell kind of thoughtlessly in Iskander to private corporations. Judge Posner was also on the panel in Shields That's right. with yeah. Judge Hamilton. Right, Judge Posner was also on the panel. As it turned out, in uh, this Shields case, the court ended up saying, so we, we sure do question Iskander, but we're not going to overrule it today because uh, none of the parties actually asked us to. And so we're just gonna throw this out there and <laughs> let all of you civil rights plaintiffs keep this in mind for the next cases down the line. So that's exactly what Mr. Gaston did. And he said, you didn't do it in Shields, but today's the day to do it, use my case. Luckily for him, Judge Hamilton was on the panel uh, also. But unfortunately, uh, he didn't win, and Iskander was not overruled. And uh, the reason was, in a majority opinion written by Judge Easterbrook, Judge Easterbrook said, look, you really haven't established that anyone was liable. You haven't shown that anyone actually had deliberate indifference toward you or that you really suff suffered a constitutional violation. There can't be vicarious liability 
if there's no liability in the first place. So we don't really even need to talk about whether Wexford is vicariously liable for its employees' actions, because you haven't done enough to show liability by any employees. Judge Hamilton concurred. He said, I agree that, uh, that there's no establishment that the medical treatment given to um, Mr. Gaston was uh, violated the Eighth Amendment because there's some you know, decent evidence that it was, it, it's not obviously wrong or cruel and unusual to delay knee surgery. Um, so there's definitely not gonna be any Wexford liability in this case. But then he went on to um, give more advice to the next crop of, of civil rights plaintiffs. Um, he said, you know, this is a pretty important issue. Uh, it keeps coming up but with more and more private entities running prisons. It's going to keep coming up. And he said, here's how civil, uh, civil rights plaintiffs should think about this going forward. Um, if Iskander is overruled and this kind of vicarious liability claim is allowed to be brought. So he said, if you can establish that a single employee um, actually acted with deliberate indifference toward you. Maybe it's a person you can identify, maybe you don't know who it was, but it was someone that you can show was employed. You should be able to, that should be a fairly simple case for vicarious liability. But then he said, the more challenging cases are where you can't show that a single employee acted with deliberate indifference, but the evidence allows an inference that a group of employees acted with collective indifference to a prisoner's health uh, or safety. Like in Mr. Gaston's case where, you know, the various doctors and whoever it was who was responsible for scheduling the next appointment or the next scan or whatever together did not get him prompt treatment. So uh, Judge Hamilton says, you know, based on how many prisoners health care suits we're getting, this is going to be more and more important. Unfortunately, neither tort law nor federal statutory law really addresses how to answer questions or really tells us how to answer questions about corporate intent in this kind of case. And Judge Hamilton says, neither do I, but <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope that our future plaintiffs will think about this as they bring these cases. Excellent. Thank you for this. Um, and um, do you think with municipal liability uh, in general that vicarious liability should be a part of it? I understand the whole argument about federalism, and that's, you know, to you, Tacey, and the rest of the folks, too. Uh, but uh, should, in an ideal world, would municipalities be vicariously liable for individuals? Well, there's certainly criticism of Monell. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Shields opinion that I talked about, Judge Hamilton says Monell itself is sort of questionable. Obviously, the Seventh Circuit can't overrule a Supreme Court decision. Uh, Justice Breyer has questioned Monell, and... Um, Which, you know, you'd know your clerk. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's some, you know, the legislative, uh, the study of legislative history that the court relied on in Monell has certainly been questioned and is a type of analysis that is probably out of favor at this point and may not have been done uh, correctly even at the time. Um, so it's vulnerable for sure. And to you guys who study common law sort of underpinnings of things, right? 19, uh, 1871, common law, vicarious liability, widely available when the statute written, right? Yes. <clears throat> so what do you make so, of that? Well, so, so, so I think uh, I agree with everything Tacey just said. So I think there's, it's pretty clearly true that a proposal to have a much broader version of Section 1983 that would make counties strictly liable for all torts committed in the county was rejected on federalism grounds. That was the one possibility was counties have an obligation to keep order. So even if it's not their employees, even if the county just allows members of the Klan to kill uh, somebody, they should be liable for that. That, that position was, on, yeah, was on the table and rejected. From that fact, the court has inferred maybe more than you can get out of that fact. <laughs> um, like the fact they rejected that doesn't mean they rejected vicarious liability for county employees and so on and so forth. So I, I do think it's vulnerable. Uh, obviously, this is my qualified immunity hobby horse. It's a little complicated to decide when the court is going to really care about what was true about the common law in the 19th century when they aren't. Like they often claim to look at it, but they have this qualified immunity thing that isn't super well uh, justified either. And one weird consequence of making counties liable for the torts of their employees while keeping everything else the same would be counties become like the one thing that's really easy to sue. Because counties don't have qualified immunity, the court has said. So easy way to get around qualified immunity will be to always sue the county. You can't sue the state because they have sovereign immunity. So then you have weird arbitrage about who's a county employee and who's a state employee and some weird Supreme Court cases about that. So I can see why if you're going to start messing with the, the current precedent, just picking out this one piece is, might cause a lot of things to unravel. That might be for the better at this point, but 
There's um, the possibility that the counties would argue that they get the benefit of the qualified immunity defense. That certainly was the federal government's position when they were arguing about how Bivens litigation and liability should be restructured. So there was a there was a proposal that the federal government take on responsibility for constitutional torts of federal officials uh, in the same way that um, maybe counties have some responsibility. Um, the argument that the federal government made was we're only going to accept that responsibility if you allow us to build our qualified immunity defenses into any vicarious liability that we accept. And so mm -hmm. that might be a I, kind of it, middle ground that... right. If Judge Easterbrook were writing it, I guess he would say, all right, maybe we can get rid of it. Maybe we can say counties are liable for the torts of their employees, but only if the employees are liable. If the employees have qualified immunity, then the counties should get vicarious qualified immunity, just like vicarious liability. I'm not sure that would be a net gain for civil rights plaintiffs. I'm not sure it would. <laughs> exactly right. And it, as long as you still had the policy claim against the county, you know, you, you're no worse off, certainly, but you're probably not much better off. Um, the question that I had about these cases, and it's one I haven't seen discussed in the literature or in the decisional law yet, is what do you do with the fact that these subcontracting private corporations are acting for the state and not for the city or the county? So it's really odd to me that you would look to the county as the analogous, um, as the analogous uh, sort of structure for a corporation that's contracting with the state, you might say, you know, uh, you know, to heck with this scandal. What we're going to do is we're going to accord the private corporation the state's sovereign immunity from suit. And what we've said in the Bivens context is you don't need to sue the entity. You can just sue the official, and that's really all you get. And even in the Bivens context, if it's a private corporation who's subbed in as the prison uh, operator, the suit against the, the private prison employee is based on common law. It's not based on a kind of constitutional tort theory. So it's obviously much more restrictive at the federal level given the court's hostility to Bivens claims. But I, I just wonder about the, the analogy to municipalities instead of to states. Yeah, that's a great point. The original Iskander decision, the corporation in question was a department store whose uh, security guard had held someone until the police took her away, a shoplifter, until the police took her away. Um, so it was a connection with a local yes, police department. Yes, it was department. a connection with a local right. police department. Right, and so department. the analogy then makes sense in that context. But in the prison context, most of the contracts are with state entities, not with mus with local yeah, and prison I agree with you. facilities. <clears throat> yeah. Although the there's also this general puzzle about why is it so counties themselves, in a sense, are really doing things on behalf of the state. Like they derive all their state power from the state. That's the reason that they're subject to the constitution and all that. So, so when we say yet yeah, they're we say they're different. They're independent. I think traditionally we said they were independent municipal corporations, right. and so they could be sued and be sued on their own. Right. So then even a corporation was contracted with the state, I wonder why we wouldn't say, look at the county as separate, then so, so is the right, right, right. corporation. Sure. And it's fascinating how, you know, all the circuit courts that looked at this issue essentially agree with this candor, right? And now you have this string side of, you know, various circuits without really analyzing the issue in depth and perhaps bringing these kind of issues that you, Jim, mentioned. We just use a string side. And Iskander is one of the first ones in it. Uh, well, thank you guys so much. It's been such pleasure to have you discuss these wonderful cases. And I hope we'll see you on Short Circuit again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.